evening, everyone. We're going to start just uh, two minutes early, and uh, we'll be done two minutes early uh, tonight. Um, 291. 291 is where we're going to start this evening. Come and dine. Uh, the Master calleth, come and dine. 291. Come and dine. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Hold his sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table. The invitation is to come and to learn and to grow and to dine on on his word to learn more about him and, and to grow in our relationship and our walk with him and i think about just different times i remember um whenever uh, amy uh, whenever uh, amy was about to uh, have chase and uh, she was pregnant with chase she had a craving for burritos for bean burritos and she really wanted bean burritos from taco bell and they were amazing and she I had no complaints because I like bean burritos from Taco Bell, but that's what she really, really wanted. And uh, it's amazing how that through different times and different things happen, um, your appetites will change. I, um, if there's one specific place, if I go and I order um, Waffle House's waffles, um, weirdest thing ever. But if I have, have you ever had Waffle House's waffles before? Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, if I eat one of those waffles, I will think about it for two or three days. I will think the next morning when I wake up, what do I want for breakfast? I'm going to go back to Waffle House and get a waffle. That, that's, I love them. I, I don't know why. And you're like, well, we make good waffles. Yes, I've had their, anyway, I'm not going to go into all of it. Other than I can have a craving for those waffles for a couple days afterward. And it's amazing how that your mind and your body can crave and want different types of food and different types of things. And then have you ever been at a point to where you just really want fellowship? You want to spend time sharing what God's done and hearing what God's doing in someone else's life. And what I love this invitation here, the invitation here is that we should be hungry. Now, blessed are there, he says, you hunger and thirst after righteousness. To where our desire and our, 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 our hunger, what we want, what our passion, what we pursue is a walk when there's our walk with God and to hear something from his word and to be challenged. And, and I love this prayer, this invitation. It's um, you can find what's going to fill your soul whenever we come and Come to Jesus Christ. That's where we can find it and uh, find satisfaction. I'm thankful for that. Uh, tonight we're gonna we're gonna pray, and I want to thank God for the satisfaction we can get from His Word and the knowledge that we can grow and we can actually have. And uh, as we grow in our knowledge of Him, um, yesterday I was a little overwhelmed with the thought that whenever we're saved, we're saved by childlike faith. We are. But then as we grow in our faith, we get to know God more and our knowledge of him increases. And as we know God more, it becomes a whole lot. Our faith, yes, it's still faith because we are hoping for that we see not. But then again, also, we get to see him true himself faithful over and over and over and over. And we grow in our faith because now it's in something that we've seen him come through on his promises and on his word. So tonight I just want to pray that as we are looking at his word, that we'll see his promises be true, and we'll learn from them tonight. That's how, how I want to start with praying uh, tonight. Uh, also, we need to pray for um, Kevin Smithers. Um, that is Dale's brother-in-law. 
And uh, I don't know all of the details other than earlier this week, um, a couple nights ago, Dale's um, brother-in-law is having some neurological issues and some health issues, and they've taken him to see doctors, and the doctors are trying to figure out, and they don't know what all is going on with him, and he's there at the hospital now. So we just need to be in prayer for, um, for Kevin Smithers is his name. And then also A.J. Harold, uh, the church planner that we support, that's uh, Brother Harold, top left corner. Uh, he and his family, I got a letter from them today, uh, but he and his family, um, oh, they are planning a trip to Pennsylvania. I don't know who may be familiar with the ACE school curriculum. They do a, um, they do a, a big um, convention conference thing for the school or so the students every year. And this year it's in Pensacola, it's in uh, Pennsylvania. So they're actually traveling from Los Angeles to Pennsylvania. And if you've read their letters, um, you're familiar with, they have a whole plethora of children. So them and their children are making a 6,000 mile trip over the course of this month. And they've asked that we'd pray for them, pray for their safety pray for them as they, they make their way over there. So we certainly want to be praying for them. And uh, just a blessing, if you have read their letters and noticed anything from their letters, uh, they've had some um, had some debts and things that have come up out of nowhere. And um, God has met the need and provided for those debts. And uh, it's amazing to see how God has provided. And they have been meeting with their junior churches and their Sunday school classes outside, um, but God's actually given them some classrooms in the building that they're renting. So um, what a blessing. If you haven't had a chance, once again, to read the missionary letters, uh, take time to read them. They'll be an encouragement to you. They'll be a blessing to you. Um, Brother Eisminger's is brand new. Uh, I just put it up this past week, and um, uh, those change out regularly. But stop by and read the, the missionary letters, and uh, we'll pray for the heralds as they're traveling. Do we have any other prayer requests? Yes. She's down to 50 pounds. Okay. And we'll pray for Lexi, one of Carl's customers. Any other prayer requests? Once again, an amazing, amazing open door there that Carl has uh, with getting to know some familiar customers that come in and out and be a witness there at work. But yeah, um, yeah, I saw a hand. Yes, sorry. Pray for Jackie Lockard's house and cell and everything close on that. Any other prayer request? Yes, Ezra. Yes, uh, Tommy. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. All right. All right. Yes, Chase. Okay. Yeah, our kids are finishing school this week, and um, which means they're doing their finals this week. Dun 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 dun. Anyway, uh, it's good. All right. Well, let's bring these requests before the Lord, and um, oh, we will uh, uh, we'll continue, and we'll sing one more song. Dear God, thank you so much for all you've done. Lord, dear God, I, I thank you, Lord, for um, uh, Brother Dale, Lord, and I just pray that you'll be with his brother-in-law and uh, just uh, be with the doctors and give them guidance and wisdom. Lord, I pray for Brother uh, Harold and their family as they're making their trip there uh, to Pennsylvania, that you'll give them safety in their travel and uh, uh, be with the van as they're traveling and just, um, Lord, guide every, every step along the way there. Lord, we pray that you will um, I'll be with Jackie. Uh, Lord, I'm, uh, Lord, it's a, thank you for being with and helping the house to sell quickly, but Lord, help everything to close and to finish up well. And I just pray that you'll be with her as she's going through this time of transition. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will provide comfort and strength to her. I, I um, dear God, I pray that you'll, um, be with Dan as he seeks to have wisdom to help and be an encouragement there. Lord, I pray for, um, Ezra's, uh, the customer that, um, his customer to Carl, has met their uh, the daughter Les Lexi, Lord. I do pray that you'll be with her, and I pray that you'll be with Carl as he's there at work to 
give him opportunities to be a witness and encouragement to his coworkers and those that are, are his customers there. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'll be with Ezra. Lord, help him with this uh, cedar allergy. We know this this time of year. And uh, also the construction work and things that he's been doing. Lord, I just pray that you will be with the allergy. And um, Lord, you'll uh, just uh, help everything, Lord, to be helping to be able to breathe and to function. And help him as he's um, oh, interviewing and searching for a job. Give him wisdom on where to go. Lord, I pray that for us as a church. Uh, Lord, I, I know we have a couple of unspokens here. And I know that... Um, uh, we all have things that we are praying for specifically that we desire you to do and ways we desire you to work in our hearts and our lives. I pray, Lord, uh, that you will uh, work specifically uh, in these requests uh, and answer them, uh, Lord, in a way that bring you honor and glory. Lord, I, I do love you. I'm so thankful for all that you've done. Uh, please bless our time together. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to walk in wisdom, to walk in knowledge of you. Uh, Lord, as Paul prayed for us to know your wisdom, for us to know your power, for us to know your love, Lord, and that will uh, drive us to be uh, subject one to another. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us uh, to live in that regard. Uh, please help the storms and uh, to just be with them, help them to be minimal. We love you once again. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I mean, we're going to do one more song, uh, 288. We're going to sing Everybody Ought to Know. 288. song we used to sing in the car when I was growing up because it has really good echoes and there's also another part that goes with it that's really high and my sister would sing it and then I would sing it and then they'd throw something at me but that's a good good song it's a great reminder that people need to know and there's some things that people need to know uh, tonight if you'll open your Bibles with me uh, to the book of Ephesians Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 and um, in the studying of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 all the way through the end of the chapter um, we were going to do it in, I was going to go ahead and say, let's just do all this in one time, but um, realizing the time and the depth and wanting to, to look at these things a little bit more in detail, uh, we're actually dividing this last section of Ephesians into four different parts, and all having to do with our standing, our standing in the Lord. So Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll start reading in verse number 10 this evening, Ephesians 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Uh, I like this verse. I love these this passage here, um, talking about the oh the preparation and how we prepare for spiritual warfare. And uh, let's pray, and we're going to jump into to, to this text. Dear God, once again, I'm so very thankful for all that you've done. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us as we take a look at this uh, passage. Um, Lord, have it be able to stand out, helping to guide us. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And whenever I got my learner's permit to drive, um, well, before I got my learner's permit to drive, at about 12 years old or 10 years old, 
I started driving for um, farm vehicles where we'd go, we'd go throw hay at about 10 or 11 years old, and I'd go work and help throw hay. And I don't know if you've ever done hay throwing before. It's not a fun thing. You have these bales and you pick them up and you throw them on the trailer and you walk over, you grab the next one, throw them on the trailer. And we would take turns of who would be the driver of the truck. Essentially what the driver of the truck did was they put the truck in gear in one, you didn't touch the gas, you just made sure that the thing stayed straight. And if you're about to run into the fence, you pushed on the brake. That's what you did. You, your job was not to keep it moving forward because it was going to keep moving forward, but it was to stop it from going running over something. When you got towards the end of the field, you would actually turn and the person, whoever the adult was in charge, I say adult like this because there was normally like a 21 year old that was out there that was telling us what to do because well, why in the world would dad go out to do it if he'd get 15 kids to go take care of it for him? But he'd go out there and he'd say, okay, turn this way. And they'd guide the truck and they'd get it all lined up. And then after they'd get it lined up, you would go ahead and you would start throwing hay the other direction. You'd throw it all the way up there. And uh, so I had an opportunity to learn how to drive with driving a hay truck. And then uh, from there, my dad took me out to the wide open field and we got in the truck and he said, here, you're going to get to drive. And I got to drive all the way through the field or through parking lots. And it was a lot of fun. Then the day came that I turned 60 or 15 and a half and I got my permit, my learner's permit. And I was pretty excited about getting my learner's permit. Um, that day in Missouri, it snowed. It was December and it snowed. And uh, we came out and, my, and the, there was snow on the ground. And my dad gave me the keys and said, you're driving home. And he had parallel parked the truck downtown St. Joe. He said, you're driving home in the snow. And I'm like, sounds good. And I got in and I was terrified. I don't think I went over 12 miles an hour the whole way home. And I'm going, come on, Dad, it's going to take forever. We're getting passed by a skier here. Um, yeah, so as we're on our way home, I finally made it home, and I was excited. And uh, through, the, through the next few months, Dad let me drive a few more times with him. Mom, wouldn't, Mom wasn't that brave. Um, but I still remember, we got on, there's a street called Pear Street, um, and it has uh, Upco, which is the, uh, uh, the animal farm animal store there and has a bunch of other things. It was the way to get to Kmart, and that's where we were going. And Dad was letting me drive, and I was excited about driving. The only problem was, Pear Street was 45 mile an hour speed limit. Every other street I had been on was 25 miles an hour. And I got on the road, and I was terrified. And my dad's truck, he drove a, uh, a 86 Dodge Ram Charger. It was really, really wide. And we're getting in this thing, and I'm driving, and I'm going through there, and I'm going about 25 miles an hour, and Dad said, speed limit's 45 you need to get up to at least 40 you need to go a little faster i don't want to go faster dad you need to go a little faster so i pushed on the gas and got going a little faster and those yellow lines start flying a little faster and all of a sudden a car starts to come in the other lane i'm going there's a car coming dad don't worry about it. it'll be fine there's a car coming you stay in your lane and it'll be okay there's a, it's getting closer, Dad! It's going to hit my mirror! It's going to hit me! <laughs> and I was terrified all the way through there. When I was in the field, when I was on the field on the road, when I was pulling the hay truck, that wasn't real driving. Now, it really is taking place. And I was terrified. And uh, I had read, and uh, we had actually watched the video, Blood on Asphalt. I don't know if you've ever seen that video before. Um, it's the driving ed. Has anybody else ever seen that? The driver's ed video? It's about crashes and accidents, and they show people before they get their driver's license so that they are controlled drivers. Yeah, it's pretty scary. But we, I, I ended up watching that, and, um, but it was real. And um, so often what happens is um, we don't realize as Christians that the Christian life and the spiritual warfare is, fair is real. As Christians, we're under attack every day. The problem is, most of the time, it's not real to us. And because the danger isn't real to us, we don't pay much attention to it. In our passage this evening, Paul begins to conclude the letter here in Ephesians with a graphic discussion and explanation of spiritual warfare. He wants to make it real because he knows spiritual warfare is coming. He, he knows that it's coming. Uh, he wants to make it real to prepare them. Um, think over the whole letter. If we look back and think of over the whole letter we've been covering for the past few months. Uh, remember, Paul prayed two prayers for these people. The first prayer he prayed early in the passage, it, it essentially said that he prayed that his readers would have the spiritual wisdom and power that, that was available to him. He wanted them to have and to know the spiritual wisdom and power. 
Uh, the second prayer was that they could know the love of God so that they would know and have the strength to walk worthy of the calling that God had called them to. That was, that was the essence of the second prayer. It led them into now they're supposed to walk worthy of that calling. Um, the one thing we know about Paul is Paul knew the power of prayer. If you go back through and you look at Paul's life, you can see his prayer. He knew that God, whenever he prayed, that God was going to answer his prayers. So he knew that God would give them the spiritual wisdom that he asked for them by filling with the Holy Spirit. So he knew that they were, that was available to him. He also knew that God would give them to strength to walk worthy of their calling. And well, what would that be? What would, how would that be seen? And we've already looked at it would be seen in their praise. It would be seen in their thankfulness. We looked at that in chapter 4. We looked at that in chapter 5. It would also be seen in their submission. And we've looked at that for the past three or four weeks in the fact that they would submit to one another. And that would manifest itself in every area of life. So, so with that being said, is Paul prayed that these things would happen. And as they yielded to the Spirit, those things happened. So here's my point on this. As we start and we desire to walk worthy... And as we desire to walk in wisdom and submission and thankfulness before God and praise before God, we now put ourselves in a unique position to where we can be attacked by the devil. Spiritual battle begins to take place. It begins to happen. As he was praying for it, he knew God was going to answer his prayer, but he also knew what that meant it meant that they would face opposition from the enemy. They would face opposition from the enemy. Um, we have a, uh, many people, Christians, we have a mixed up view of God's blessings. Many think that whenever we're walking the closest to God, that's when we're not supposed to face opposition. Um, <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. Why does the enemy need to fool with somebody who's no threat to him? Why does the enemy need to worry about it? Uh, I love watching basketball. And it's, it's hysterical whenever you watch um, uh, high school basketball. If you have an all-star player, they will double or triple team that one all-star player and leave the other people completely, totally alone. Uh, there was a high school basketball player I like to watch. His name was Phil Forte. Phil Forte, could, if he got the ball within 10 feet of the half-court line, the opposite side, he could shoot and make it. He shot 95% from half-court. That's insane. You're like, okay, that's right. Um, NBA professionals shoot about 85%, the, the good ones, from three-point. And so he's draining. So he, but he's only, the problem is he was only like five foot six, so he couldn't really go much farther than that. But it was hilarious to watch because I was watching one of their games, and they took a player. Stand up, Chase. The other team took a player, and this is the other player. Whenever they had the job, this is where the other team's player went. And he just stood like this the whole entire time. You know why the defenders stood that close to him? Because it was a threat. They didn't want him to score. And, but the guy that was over here going, <laughs> oh, look, there's balloons in the stands. You don't need to guard him. My point is, um, we've all seen people like that. The, the point is, the enemy doesn't need to fool with somebody who's no threat. So when we're walking the closest to the Lord, we are obviously going to be a threat to Satan. And he attacks his threats. The bigger the threat, the more vicious the attack. Make no mistake about it. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, if we're walking worthy of the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will experience opposition. You're going to have opposition. Well, why? This passage says um, we have the devil is going to be we. Uh, we're going to need to stand against the wilds of the devil. Verse 11. Um, and because we will face opposition. We need protection. We're facing opposition against somebody that we can't defeat. We need protection. We need protection so we can stand strong in the face of our enemy. That's what I want for us this evening. Like Paul, throughout the course of this past week, uh, I've prayed that we would have wisdom as a church that would be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been praying that God would actually fill and guide and direct us as a church. Um, I, I've prayed that we'd walk worthy of our call, calling we, I prayed that as our walk starts to walk worthy of God's calling, that we'll praise him, that we'll be thankful, um, that we will be in subjection to his word and we'll be submitting to each other and serving each other. That's what I've been praying for for our church. So as we've been praying these things, do we believe that God answers prayer? Do we believe God? Yeah, we believe God answers prayer. So if we've been praying these things for our church, 
we can know that the devil's going to attack. We know that it's going to happen. So how do we prepare? I want each of us to stand strong in the face of the enemy. In order to do that, we're going to look at three essential truths tonight about standing in the face of the enemy. The first truth is that you can only stand by being strong. Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can only stand in the face of the enemy by being strong. Um, <laughs> I love that first word, finally, my brethren. Uh, a lot of preachers do a great job of emulating Paul here with saying finally, um, <laughs> whenever they use the word finally. Um, basically, whenever he uses the word finally in his books, he, he means the same thing as a lot of preachers do. Um, finally simply means that uh, absolutely nothing. I'm still not done yet. We're going to keep going. Um, <laughs> just, okay. Um, I heard a preacher uh, that a lot of times had three sermons. No matter what, he has three sermons. The problem was he may have four or five points that start with the word secondary, <laughs> and that way he kept going. Um, several of his letters, Paul does this, and he says, finally. What I love is after he says finally, he keeps on going with this wonderful passage, and he gives us the armor of God, and he tells us about the armor of God. He starts, he doesn't give us the armor of God, the Bible does, but he, he gives us the picture here. So, he starts by telling his readers to be strong. So I'm going to ask you a question. We'll be a little interactive tonight. Whenever you hear this, the term to be strong, just in general, what do you think? What are your thoughts whenever you think of strength? And uh, some of my thoughts are, are muscle men. And even like, yes, go little kids, like, are you strong? And they'll immediately go, yeah, and they'll show you your muscles. Yeah. What are some of the things you think about when you think of to be strong? Yeah. Yeah, being patient. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a hard thing to do, to have the patience to be strong. Mm -hmm. To be steadfast. Yeah. Resilient. Yeah. yeah I, one of the things that came into my mind was, um, oh, there have been times whenever I've been sick and I've uh, I've stayed home through the day and um, or I've stayed up really late and as you're sitting there late and you have the TV on or you fall asleep on the couch and you wake up and you have those ads for the workout being like building strength and things ads it's like you know, are you a weenie what do you remember the old um, oh I think his name is Atlas the Atlas commercials they were not commercials they were they were like an ad that were in like newspapers and things they were in like magazines. Uh, essentially, it was this guy that was selling this book to where you could learn how to build muscles and be. The ad was all about this wimpy guy got beat up, and then he went, he read his book, and came back and beat up the guy who beat him up. And that was the whole ad. I'm like the stupidest thing ever. But yeah. Anyway, um, so this is not. Is that the kind of strength that Paul is talking about here? No, of course not. <laughs> no, I had a friend who said, "I want to be strong, so I'm going to punch walls because that's going to make my hands strong." I'm like. Okay, whatever. Just don't put all on the wall because then you have to patch it. Uh, of course, that, that's not what he's talking about. We all know that he's talking about spiritual strength. But even though he's talking about spiritual strength, do we look at spiritual strength the same way as the wimp in the ads look at strength? And saying, I'm being defeated. Now I have to have the strength. Let me put it this way. Do we look at the spiritual strength as something that I need so that I can do what I need to get back at all of those bad things that happened to me. Let me read that again. Do we look at spiritual strength as something that I need so that I can do what I need to do to get back at all those things that happened to me? Or is spiritual strength is something that I need so that I can be blessed? Or something that I need so that I can have victory? My question is, is spiritual strength really all about me? Well, if spiritual strength is like the workout ads, it is all about us. If spiritual strength is is something that we have to send off to God so that we can get it for ourselves and be strong, but it isn't. Notice what the Bible says, verse 10. It does not say, get your strength from the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong. Or he doesn't say, finally, my brethren, get your strength from the Lord. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It says that we're to be strong in him and the power of his might. The day we start thinking the strength in ours, we are, if the strength is ours or in us, we are going to be defeated. We can't stand. Even when we think that it's our strength that he gave us. Spiritual strength is his. That's my point here. 
It belongs to him. And it's always going to be. It's all his. That word, the, the term there translated be strong that we have there, it's a passive word. It's a, a passive verb there. And what it means is it's something that happens. It's something about something that happens. It's not something that happens to you, but it's done on your behalf. My point is you're not the one doing it. That's the point. You're not the one that, that is doing it. In other words, Paul commands us to be strong but he knows that the strength cannot be our own. It has to be in the Lord. It has to be his strength at work in our lives. He has to be doing the work. No matter what kind of strength we muster up, it's never going to be strong enough to stand against the face of our enemies. No matter how determined I am, let's get really practical here. I have a list at the end to kind of apply all this, but I'm going to mention it here. If, if we're trapped by greed, or, or by lust, or by anger, or by um, selfishness. No matter how strong we are that says, I am not going to do or participate in this again. We're not strong enough to stand in our own strength. It has to be standing in His strength. Because we are going to get defeated over and over and over again. We can't defeat our enemy. It has to be God's strength, the power of His might working in us. This first essential truth about standing in the face of enemies is that you can only stand by being strong. And that strength has to come from the Lord. Uh, the second one, uh, the second one here, uh, let's take a look at verse 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The, the second truth is, that you can only stand by being submerged. By being submerged. Once again, let me explain here. You can only stand by being submerged. Um, my father-in-law loves to bowl. He loves to bowl. I mean, he bowls every single Monday night and every once in a while and whenever we're with him. And some of the things that he likes to do is he likes to go bowling. Now, me, I like bowling for about the first game. About the second game, I'm all about let's see if we can get the ball to go behind our back. Let's go between our legs. Let's see if we can get it to bounce down the lane. And he's over there still, as serious as could be. Every mark, every step, every movement is measured and, and precise. But the thing I hate the most about bowling, and this is weird, but I can't stand the bowling shoes. You know, you get there and they're like, here are these shoes that have been worn by 65 billion people. Don't worry, they were clean with bug spray. Like, yeah, and you put them on your feet and you go to the bowl and you, you wear them and Oh, you, you put on the bowling shoes whenever you go to bowl. And then whenever you get done bowling, like what, you don't have to wear the rentals, you could buy your own. <laughs> I am not going to pay $65 for something I do once a year. Not going to happen. Anyway, um, but you put the bowling shoes on, and then you go and you take the bowling shoes off, and you set them aside. And we do this with lots of different things. If you're going to go hunting, you go and you put on your hunting clothes. You go out and you spend the time hunting. After you get done hunting, you go back home. You take off the hunting clothes. You put them on. You take them back off. You put them on. You get the picture here. Um, it, it has to do with what you're doing. Um, this is the way we put on clothes and the way we're... But is the way that we put on clothes the way we're supposed to put on the armor of God? What I mean by that is, as I was getting dressed today... Um, Today, I, uh, I did actually actually look in the mirror. I still don't know if it matches or not, but it's okay. Um, when I got dressed today, I was putting stuff on, and I'm putting it on, and I was trying to figure out, do I need to wear this? Do I need to wear this? Do I need to grab my rain jacket for later? What I mean by this is, do we say, well, today I think I'm going to need my shield, so I, I'm going to grab that. You, you never know whenever you're going to need your helmet. You never know when you're going to need your helmet. Let me put that on today. Yeah, I better get that too. That would work if we were going to be involved in a social event. But we're going into battle. The battle that we have no hope of winning in and of ourselves. A battle that against someone that we can't see. A battle against someone that we really can't even fathom in our wildest imaginations. We're going to battle here. So how can we stand against that type of enemy? By being submerged in God's protection. Once again, uh, the word translated put on here, it, it's a passive verb. In other words, we are taking advantage of the covering, but it's not something that we're doing to ourselves. We are actually being covered. Oh, follow me. This is pretty neat. And 
The word doesn't mean necessarily what we think of whenever we put on clothes. It literally carries the idea of being dunked or being plunged, is what he's talking about. So it can be completely, totally covered. You can't be dunked or plunged into just two pieces of the armor of God. You can't just be dunked or plunged into the shield and the helmet. But remember this, we talked about the individual pieces. We're going to talk about those in, in the coming weeks. You can't pick and choose. Well, preacher, I have found faith and I have found salvation, but I'm not really comfortable with those feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I found salvation and I found faith. Have those. But with the gospel, <laughs> I don't know. Or, you know, I'm not really into studying the word of God. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That attitude, whenever you go into spiritual battle, will get you defeated. The attitude that says, I'm only going to partially apply and live out, well, the armor, it's going to get you defeated. Satan is going to walk all over you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Back when Peter wrote that, do you suppose he's looking back at his own life? And if you remember back in Luke chapter 22, verse 30, Jesus told Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired you that you may shift, sift you as wheat. And then in his own strength, he put on his own armor. He even put a sword on in his own strength. He said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. Um, you remember that verse 30? It was back in Luke chapter 22. Uh, of course, we all know what happened. Peter denied the Lord three times. He tried to stand before the enemy wearing his pitiful armor that he put on in his own strength. He tried to stand to the enemy with his own physical sword. Do you remember what happened there? Um, as his adversary, the devil devoured him. But later, he saw Jesus' forgiveness, and he saw the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter knew what Paul meant whenever... Peter knew what Paul meant whenever Paul said to put on the whole armor of God. He knew what it meant to allow God to submerge him in his protection. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4. This is good stuff. Look at verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and as many were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. But when they had sent them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deeds done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. Wow, what happens here, and it's amazing, is this man who boldly put on his own armor in front of Jesus, who said that he would go to prison and die for Jesus, that denied him, his own armor failed him miserably. His own strength failed him completely and totally. He failed at the hands of a little maid, a little young lady, it says a damsel, accused him, and he fell at her hands. What kind of enemy is that? It's a damsel. That's who he was terrified of. Um, Oh, yet the same man, when he was submerged with the whole armor of God, and, and it's amazing looking back through chapter 4, how much of the armor of God stands out in his testimony, his words here. 
a man submerged in the holy arm of God. Look at the difference. He struck his finger in the face of the people who held his life in his hands. Can you imagine his bony finger sticking out in the middle of what he's saying here as he's pointing the finger at them? He told them that they were guilty of killing the Son of God. And then he gave them the gospel. He confronted them with their sin and he gave them the solution to their sin. That's bold. How was he able to do that? Because he was now submerged in the whole armor of God. He was now not standing in Peter's strength. He was now standing in his strength. Peter didn't take out his sword like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane because he knew the battle wasn't against flesh and blood. But instead, he pulled out the sword of the Spirit, the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, his shield of faith and trusting him, and he stood to face the enemy. That's an awesome picture here. You can only stand in the face of the enemy by being strong. You can only stand in the face of enemy by being submerged. What I mean by being submerged? By taking the whole armor of God and applying it to every area of your life. You can only stand by in the face of the enemy, lastly, by seizing. By seizing, by grasping a hold of. Look at verse 13, back in Ephesians chapter 6. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The third, third essential truth is that you can only stand by seizing. So to be able to stand in the face of our enemy, we have to be strong. But our strength is not our strength, it's the Lord's strength. If we use our strength, we're going to be defeated. The only way to stand is if he applies his strength through us. We have to be strong. And in order to be strong, we have to, immer we have to submerge ourselves. We have to put on the full armor of God. But there again, we're not really doing anything. If we clothe ourselves in his armor, uh, in our own armor, we're going to be defeated. So the only way to stand is by allowing his strength and by allowing his armor to do its work, um, his protection. So to be strong, God does it. To be submerged, God does it. All right. Wow. God does everything and I can just sit here and let him do it. No, um, we have no play. No, wrong. We have a we have a part to play. That's why the Holy Spirit in Paul inspired Paul to switch from using passive verbs to now he's used as an active verb here. God applies His strength through us. He submerges us in His old armor, but He expects us to take it up. He expects us to grasp it, to take hold of it, to seize it. That's what that verse here, um, oh, verse thirteen. Take unto you. It's, that's the action part. The Lord has provided everything that's necessary for you to stand. All you have to do is take it up. You have to seize it. Well, what do you mean by seize it? You have to take it and apply it to your life. You have to live it out. Um, it's his armor. He'll submerge you in it. All you have to do is to take it up. It's his strength. He'll supply it through you. You're, you were by faith you were saved. Um, Jesus did all the work on the cross uh, whenever he said it is finished. He, he paid all of the price for our salvation. All the work could ever be done for salvation was complete. <laughs> wow, that's the grace. I, I love the fact that it says um, Ephesians chapter 2, he's already said it, for by grace he is saved through faith. You take up your salvation through faith. What I mean by that is faith is you trusting and you believe in that Jesus did it. The strength is God's. The armor is God's. He gives it. He clothes you with it. But now you have to take it up. You have to seize it. So I simply say, how? Isn't that a good question to have to answer? Is how? Well, I'm glad you asked it then. In chapter 4, since chapter 4, Paul has been telling us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful when you read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 to see who it is that loved us, to see what he did to save us, to see uh, how he has changed us and made us worthy. Everything that was involved in, in our calling, everything that was involved in our saving, all everything that was involved in him giving us a purpose. If Christ has saved you, we need to walk worthy of his salvation. Not to earn his salvation, because you can't do that. But if I've been saved, we should act like it. We should live like it. Um, we need to be well-disciplined in our walk with him. 
Well, how is well-discipline in my walk with him seen? Well, let me just say, how is well-discipline seen? We're using a military term here. How is well-discipline seen in the military? You make your bed. You shine your shoes. You put your uniform on correctly. You make sure your keel line is correct and straight. You make sure your shoes are polished and well-kept. Well, this is... The military have these different guidelines? Well, my point on this is this. To be a well-disciplined Christian, we have to spend time in his word. We've got to spend time in prayer talking to our Savior. We need to spend time walking with him and communicating with him, listening to him. We need to spend time obeying the orders he gives us. Whenever he shows us something clearly in his word to follow and to do, we need to say yes, sir, and to do it. We need to be submissive enough to obey his word. Um, we need to be submissive enough. I go back once again to the military, military thing there. As uh, um, oh, oh, it's uh, many times many people will join the military. They ask them if they want to keep their sideburns, and they say yep. So they put them in a Ziploc bag for them. Um, my my point is, uh, there are some things that you're going to have to part with if you're going to follow and serve the Lord. Um, that means I have to get my sideburns shaved. No, but we should be willing to if that's what God wants us to do. That's my point. We need to be willing to do whatever God's word says for us to do. We need to be disciplined in our walk with him. I love that uh, there's a, a book that was written by a major general, and it said, if you want to be successful in life, make your bed. That's how it started off. And the whole point behind the book was, at least you got one thing done that day. <laughs> it was your bed is made. <laughs> um, and I'm like, hey, that's, a good, that's good. That way I only have to do one thing a day, just make sure my bed's made. Um, but the whole point is that, that you live in a structured you live in a structured way to be well disciplined as a Christian you have to spend time in his word we should be worshipful in our walk with him our life should be worshiping and pleasing him a life that's submitted to him a life that's following him my point is we need to seize it we need to seize it with all of our might we need to seize and hang on to it uh, we need to take into you the whole armor of God to, to take it to put it in our life to apply it uh, to live it out um Somebody once said that we should pray knowing that it all depends on God, but work as if it all depends on us. And I like that statement. It's, yes, we need to pray for some things, but how often do we pray for something? I don't want to get off too bad on a rabbit trail here. But how often do we pray for something that we never intend to do anything with? Lord, please save my neighbor. Now, will you ever go give him a tray of cookies and invite him to church or to give him a track? No, but I've just prayed God save my neighbor. That's all I need to do. Well... No, if we're going to pray for God to save my neighbor, we need to be a witness to our neighbors. Are you with me on all of this? If we say, Lord, I, I want you to, oh, dear God, I want you to change the heart of my child. I want you to reach the heart of my child. And then you look at the word of God that um, the way that you reach and touch the heart of a child is by investing and spending time with. And you say, well, okay, well, well, I don't want to do all that, but I want you to change the heart of my child, Lord. Well, no, it's going to start with you spending time developing relationship with your children lord i want my children to follow and to serve you well dad you need to turn up and change your children up in the nurture and admonition of the lord they go hand in hand um we need to be willing to pray for what we're able to work in that regard um but seize it and, and take it as our, our life depends on it my question tonight is this are you able to stand in the face of the enemy and not in our own strength are you standing firm in the face of temptation when temptation comes, what is your response? Are you being defeated? Or are you having victory? Are you standing in the area of greed or lust or pride or selfishness or fits of anger or bitterness? How well are you standing when it comes, well, to sin or in your own life? Do you have victory here? That's my point. Do you have victory here? Oh, The only hope for rescue that we have for our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only rescue that we have and hope that we have for our strength and for our submerging and for our ability to stand is only being in his strength. So if I was to ask, who are you living your life? Whose strength are you living your life after? Is it his strength that you're living through? Or is it your own knowledge and will and understanding? Let's, tonight, my kind of my challenge is this. It's the fact of 
Well, let me read the verse. For I'll take you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, I love verse 14, the first two verses. Stand, therefore. <laughs> I know it's not a complete sentence. I know he's telling you how to stand in the next few verses. But having done all to stand, do it. Stand. That's my thought tonight. It's God, I want to seize this for myself. I want to seize this and live your armor submerged in you completely and totally. That's what we want for ourselves. Dear God, I'm so thankful for all you've done. Thank you tonight for your word. Dear God, I pray that you help us to realize that when we're filled with the Spirit, walking worthy of our calling, Lord, that the opposition that we face is very real, that we desperately need your protection. Lord, I pray that you help us to realize how real our enemy is. Help us to see how he attacks. Lord, and to take steps. Lord, uh, to stand in a way that's pleasing to you. Thank you once again for all that you've done. Lord, help us to take these standing orders and to stand, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's service. We are very thankful that we have the opportunity to preach the Word of God. We do pray that the preaching of the Word of God was a challenge and an encouragement to you. If God spoke to your heart, we'd love to hear about it. We'd love to hear how God is challenging you and what God wants to do in your life. If you'll visit our website, northwoodsbaptist.org, uh, you'll find a link there that will uh, be an email or a phone number for uh, you to call us directly. Once again, thank you so much for being part of our service. We do pray that the Lord blesses and keeps you and that you have a great day. God bless. Mm -hmm.